this happens, Sorry. would you like me to do Josephine first and then do yeah. the minute? Okay, well, let's. Oh, sorry. Um, one of the things on the agenda today is to get an update from Josephine Gibson from the Mental Health Association, uh, giving us some updates. So we may as well get started with her, and then we'll do the minutes after that. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Um, I brought Jenny Miller, my um, COO. And we have a little slideshow presentation. Since it's been a while, I think that I've talked to you guys. <laughs> um, Jenny, are you going to share your screen? Ah, I can certainly do that. That would be great. Give me one second, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, get rid of that. Hi, Larry. Hello. <laughs> All right. Can everyone see? Yeah. Yes, we can. All right. Um. Okay, so I guess we'll start. Um, I think I'll just start by reading through the slides and then I will just start commenting. <laughs> I don't love a slideshow actually. <laughs> I usually just like to start talking, but um, our mission, as a team of peer specialists, we draw on our lived experience and specialized training to empower families, individuals, and groups through peer support, advocacy, and programming that promotes mental health recovery, early intervention, and prevention of mental illness. Um, our services also work to end stigma of mental illnesses by encouraging open conversations and education. Next, <laughs> a little about MHA. Um, we're a community-based nonprofit organization and can you believe this year is 70 years that this agency has been committed to providing essential non-clinical services that address the needs of individuals in Tompkins County. Mm -hmm. um, we're one of 25 affiliates in New York State and one of 40, 143 affiliates uh, of Mental Health America, which I think there's 38 states with mental health associations. Um, our Funding mostly comes from New York State Office of Mental Health, Tompkins County, and private donations and grants. Um, our budget is just under six hundred thousand. Uh, about four fifty comes from the New York State Office of Mental Health. Uh, just over a hundred comes from the county, and the rest is from mental health first aid trainings, grants, private donations. Um, and just to give you some idea, salar or salaries and direct care is uh, about 400,000 of our budget. So we have very little wiggle room <laughs> for services. Um, all right, uh, all of our services are free, except for mental health first aid training. The eight hour course costs uh, $80. Um, of course, we do sliding scales because we never want it to be cost prohibitive. Um, and in fact, many of our trainings are um, sponsored by the SOFI Fund. Um, they often give us funding to provide uh, mental health first aid to large groups. Recently, I think um, we did DSS, we did St. John's Community uh, Shelter, um, history center <laughs> there's been a couple of larger agencies trainings um, and mental health first aid uh, we do youth mental health first aid adult mental health first aid and we can do higher education mental health first aid um, maj is a peer-led and peer-run agency um, and i just want to speak a little bit about what that means um, every person at maj 
identifies as a peer, which means they have a lived mental health experience, um, recovery from a mental health condition, a substance use disorder, or both. Um, and when I say everyone, I mean myself included. Um, when I started at MHA 24 years ago, I was actually quite sick, um, undiagnosed and untreated. I'd been hospitalized multiple times um, and in and out of treatment. I knew I wanted to do work to, to help people not feel the way I was feeling <laughs> when I came to MHA. Um, but under an incredible boss, you know, I learned how to uh, my own, you know, start my own recovery journey and learn how to help other people and become a peer specialist. So, um, Larry, are you asking a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Is the board also peer? Um, yes, most of them identify as peer. Okay, cool. Three out of four. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, uh, I think, um, next slide, please. <laughs> I think that the peer support, um, is so important. I think it is, um, it offers a kind of acceptance and understanding and validation that isn't found in a um, in a clinical setting, um, and it also but it also complements uh, clinical treatment. It's not a replacement; um, it's a complement. So, why is a peer port agency? Why, like I just said, it's truly unique in that it you know. We have been there, and that's why we're offering the support. Um, we can we assist people in finding, um, setting goals, and getting on their own recovery journey. There's so many ways to do that. Everyone's is their own individual and unique journey. Um, we help people find strengths. Um, we also, I think, dispel myths about it, what it means to have a mental health condition, um, which helps reduce stigma. Um, when I tell people that I'm an executive director of mental health, they always are like, oh boy, we need you, I need you. Or they make a lot of jokes, you know, about mental health and the work um, and the crazies. But then when I tell them about that I'm a peer and it's a peer agency, um, I think it uh, helps to reduce stigma when we share our stories with people. Um, and all, you know, all of our programming is led by people that are either have their peer certification or are working on their peer certification. Which brings me to what is a peer specialist? A peer specialist is an individual with lived mental health experience who has demonstrated resiliency and perseverance in their own recovery journey. Um, there's also, uh, the certification, which is done by the New York uh, Peer Certification Board. And um, a person has to have uh, 2,000 hours of work as a peer advocate. They have to take uh, courses through the Academy of Peer Services, which are actually quite rigorous. I felt like I was, you know, in college doing these. There's 14 court courses, there's five electives. Sometimes it takes people um, years to get it done. You have to have a high school diploma. And, you know, part of your work is to identify and self disclose your own journey. There's also continuing education requirements for peer specialists which I haven't done this year, <laughs> but you have to do a certain amount of courses for credit to keep your certification, which you have to renew every two years. Um, any questions about that slide? Sorry, I'm moving quickly. No? Okay, next one, Jenny. So we have like four main programs, um, peer support and advocacy, which is really um, 
mostly done at individual peer counseling sessions, uh, goal setting, teaching self-help skills, working on evidence-based practices like uh, RAP, uh, which probably a lot of you have heard of, wellness recovery action planning, um, helping people navigate uh, additional support services, uh, create a support network, um, and also we advocate for the person if they need to. We will call the clinic, we'll call the hospital, we'll call DSS, we'll work with someone, um, whatever they need. Um, our psychosocial program, which I think a lot of people are most familiar with, that's the sort of drop-in socialization program. Um, and that happens at the outreach center downstairs, uh, which we recently got with partial funding from the county. Um, and so we have a space uh, uh, on the commons. Uh, it's um, the first floor of Center Ithaca, but you can walk in off the commons. It's a safe space. Uh, people agree to the rules while they're there. Um, and it's basically a place for people to make connection, socialize, but then we also have a lot of groups going on all day long. Um, just a variety of gaming groups and journaling groups and yoga. And um, I'll get to that in another slide. <laughs> um, and then there's our justice service program, which is uh, growing quite rapidly. Um, and that is, uh, we only have one full-time gentleman in that program. We're about to hire someone else for him, which is great because it's really expanding. Um, he goes to the Tompkins County Probation once a week and does a group for those participants. He also attends Ithaca Wellness and Recovery Court weekly um, and ends up doing one-on-one -on -one sessions uh, with those referrals from those programs. Um, he also arranges like workshops. So recently Judge Peacock asked him to do a, us to do like a financial workshop. So we had, we called Visions Credit Union. They came to the outreach center um, and did a, a financial 101 class for participants of the wellness and recovery court. Um, they were also recently mandated, which we didn't love because that's not who we are, to do rap. <laughs> um, so I had to ask Judge Peacock to not mandate rap because you can't do that. Um, it's a voluntary program. So I asked him, you know, to mandate time at MHA um, with Larry, who runs the justice program. And so but people ended up enrolling in RAP anyway, and they just finished the first month, which was two weekly sessions. Um, and there, they had nine participants from uh, the court and it, it went very well. They all completed, um, it was great. So that's uh, justice services. Um, and then there's the family support services, uh, which is, serves parents of who have children who are experiencing uh, emotional uh, behavioral health challenges or addiction. Um, this is an area which we have a challenge with family support services. Um, the feedback that I get is that people want us to be working with their child which is not what family support services are. Family support services are working with the parents. Um, mm -hmm. And we have uh, we have trouble keeping parents engaged in this programming, which is too bad. Next, oh, does anybody have any questions about this slide? <laughs> Larry does. But you're muted. I had a quick question about your relationship with um with the psychiatric unit, unit at Cuba Medical Center. I'm wondering if you can talk about that for a moment. Yeah, we 
we're, we do a weekly group at Cayuga Medical Center. Um, quite a few referrals come from um, people at the unit um, to our one-on-one -on -one programming. Um, but we just started that up uh, in December, started it back up. We had stopped it during COVID. We were also understaffed. But now we have two people who go up to the unit up every Friday um, and meet with people there. And they've had quite a lot of success with that programming. Um, again, it's not supposed to be mandatory, <laughs> but they really um, do their best to get everybody to attend the program. And they basically just do sort of an introduction to our services and talk about, you know, um, having a wellness toolbox. Sometimes they'll do a little activity with people, but they have been um, seeing people come here after the hospital, which is great because we that's such an important um, relationship for us. Great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So this is just an example of the activity groups and support groups. And I divided them because the social activity groups are considered psychosocial, whereas the peer groups are under um, peer support and advocacy. So it's just different funding. Um, and you can see how the, the social activities are more of a social gathering and connection. And the peer led groups are about skills, working on coping skills, working on uh, wellness skills. So those are just some samples. Um, there's a link to our calendar here on our website, which um, you can go to at any time and has details on these groups. They're not all offered at the same time. Um, but these are like a good sample of what we're usually doing. Another big part of our services is community education. Um, again, mental health first aid, which I already talked about. We also do customized presentations on requests. So a lot of times people will just ask for like an in-service about a certain topic or issue. Um, I don't know if people know Melanie Little, but she's our, uh, our, our fabulous community educator. She spends a lot of time in um, the school's health classes at ACS and at Ithaca High School. Um, and then she also does sessions at so many other businesses. I'm kind of blanking. Jenny, can you think of some right now? Um, she's gone to like TC3. She's done stuff at the Cornell uh, residence halls. She does stuff at um, uh, day camps, which is funny, like summer camps. She talks to staff at summer camps. She just did a presentation for uh, the, the Youth Bureau, the Ithaca Youth Bureau, and all their programs that work with children. So just the requests come in, and we just do the best we can to um, meet those needs. Um, we have a couple of like packaged programs that a lot of us are trained in, like a Mental Health 101, which is a 90 minute presentation, um, and RAP, which can be used for individuals, businesses, groups. Um, yeah, so that's community education. These are just some of the other agencies that we collaborate with. Um, the Bruce from the PROSE program <laughs> comes and does uh, information sessions that are drop in during our drop in times and makes himself available to people. Um, Challenge Industries, their mental health outreach worker uh, has drop in has hours during our drop in program and also meets with his clients there at the outreach center. Um, I just talked about the Cuga Medical Center. NAMI has actually located, has uh, is renting an office space in our offices. So we've started doing a lot of stuff together just because we're right next door to each other. Um, we're working on 
multiple projects. I think the, the most important one is coming up is we're doing um, first responder training down in the outreach center, four days uh, working on uh, first responder wellness. We have a, um, a company that's coming to work with law enforcement, firefighters, EMTs, to talk to them about taking care of their mental health and sort of hopefully challenge them to take care of them at all. Um, we work with Scott from Sophie Fund on a lot of things. We recently had an amazing um, youth art show in, at the end of last year where we had, I think it was 30, was it 30 um, young people who submitted artwork and we had that in the outreach center. We had a lot of people come in. It was on a first Friday and some of these kids actually sold their artwork and their ages were um, five to like 18 year olds. And it was awesome. And uh, we sort of asked them to provide a piece of artwork that expressed how they felt about their mental health and about it happened to be around bullying because it was bullying prevention month. And it was very successful. And if you go to the Sophie Fund website, you can see all the artwork. We created a blog for that. Um, and then we have a great relationship with Cornell University with their work study and interns. <laughs> Quick facts. <laughs> um, this is 2022 stats. I'm very sorry. I'm not quite done with 23. <laughs> I will be any moment now. Um, we served 1,420 unique individuals across all our programs in 2022. It's, it's, I'm sure it's very similar in 23 also. And those 1,420 people had 8,210 service contacts. So they either came to group, they came to drop in, they did a Zoom group, they did a one-on-one, -on -one, they did a phone call. That's all of that counted up. Um, our staff is nine people. Four of us are admin staff and we have, who are peer specialists, but we also have five part-time peer specialists. A lot of the direct care is done by the five part-timers. However, we have been filling in a lot lately. <laughs> the full timers. Um, we get feedback from surveys that we give at every single uh, service that we provide. Um, they're just, I wish I had one right here. I thought I did, but they're just uh, small survey cards with, you know, faces and they circle one and they can give us feedback on the card and we get quite a lot of feedback, which is great. And staff are always encouraging people to tell me the truth about things. <laughs> um, we're a living wage employer, Tompkins County living wage employer. We do do formal intakes. If somebody has been here uh, three times, the next time they come in, they do a formal intake, which is not like a clinical intake, even though we do collect a lot of information, we're not collecting social security numbers and health insurance cards and that kind of stuff, but we are collecting contact information and demographics and stuff. Um, uh, peer staff participate in monthly supervision, weekly staff meetings, biweekly team meetings. We also have quarterly um, staff development days, and then we do annual strategic planning of programs and vision boarding. Um, and these are, we have seven certified peer specialists, two working on it. We have three certified mental health first aid facilitators. We have four certified wellness recovery action plan facilitators. We have four mental health 101 facilitators and three mental health community partner facilitators. That's a new program from Mental Health Association of New York State. Um, it's an amazing program. It's uh, it's just a tool to use to work with someone one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it's meant to be used after hospital discharge 
to help people um, work on creating goals and then working on those goals. Ugh, I should breathe. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get it all in. <laughs> okay, so challenges. Um, one of the challenges we have is doing, uh, proving how important we are and how valuable we are. <laughs> we have a lot of anecdotal evidence, but it's really hard to show that someone was going to go to the hospital and didn't, you know, all we have is people telling us that. So it's very hard to, to show. That's one of the challenges we always have. Um, we have a lot of work to do still around peer specialists being professionals. And there is a lot of stigma. I feel like there's stigma even with uh, clinicians and mental health professionals that are not seeing us as, as valuable as we are. And peer work is important, but we have come a long way, so. <laughs> um, and then also, you know, we have a peer workforce. So people are in recovery. And sometimes the recovery lapses, and that is difficult and prevents staffing issues. Um, there's a lot of supervision involved with having a peer staff. Um, that's how I spend most of my time. And, um, and sometimes somebody has to leave to take care of themselves. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, funding is always a challenge. And I put a little history of the COLA here, which I don't have to read to you because you all probably know it, but <laughs> we are just uh, not getting enough increases. Um, exciting upcoming stuff. I guess this is kind of our launch, Jenny. We're changing our name. <laughs> um, we are often confused with the clinic, which actually I don't know if that's gonna get better because. <laughs> I don't know, um, but we're changing our name to Mental Health Advocates of the Finger Lakes. We're also hoping to expand into other counties and do some rural work. So we wanted to, yeah, explore that and grow into that beautiful name. Um, we're adding a SERPA to our team, which I've wanted to do for years, um, but we actually have quite a few applications and we're planning to hire a certified recovery peer advocate in the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually, um, a certified recovery advocate has the um, experience with a substance use disorder and they are in recovery. Um, and then our mm -hmm. annual Better Together event this year, we are doing quite a bit here at MHA. We've created the, a website for the event um, and we're handling the financial part of the event and working with Sandy True to get sponsorship, but it is going to be fabulous. Please come May 11th to Stewart Park. Um, last year, we expected 200 people and there were 600. <laughs> Who knows what we'll have this year, but it's a totally free event. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have food trucks and entertainment music, uh, workshops all day. So please put it on your calendar. Is that the end of my slide? Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> Some nice testimonials. Thank you, Jenny, for putting those in. I didn't look at them all yet. <laughs> Most of these come from our evaluations. I think that's the end. Great, just uh, questions. Uh, Jessica, I love your organization. I think you guys do so much really important work. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about um, with the family support services, um, just uh, and with, I believe Melanie Little's previous role was maybe as a like youth peer advocate, but but since then there's been difficulties finding another person to fill that role. So just thinking about like 
Um, just wondering if you could speak to that or like the particular challenges that you've run into in terms of, um, I, I saw that you guys have CFTSS under the Family Support Services, mm -hmm. which I know is on a wait list right now. So just beyond the, the general like funding challenges, I was hoping you could speak more to that. Um, so the whole program is actually quite a challenge from engagement to staffing. Um, right at this very moment, we actually just don't have an FPA. So we've we've had <laughs> multiple FPAs take a shot at running the program um, and haven't been able to get enough participation in the program. Um, uh, you know, these are people with backgrounds in family services. It's not like they weren't trying, but they haven't been able to get engagement and same with youth services. And we all know how amazing Melanie is and she could not get the youth to stay engaged in her programming. Um, what has worked is to actually go in the schools and do mental health and wellness presentations. So that piece is still there and she still does that. But um, actually getting people in here to engage in, you know, any sort of practice or skill building or um, has been very challenging. And I don't, you know, like I said, I've been here 24 years. And the only time that family support was successful is when we just did respite. And so we had a respite program through Pathways, which for I could talk about that more if you want, which was totally unsustainable for us because we had workers that we spent a, a lot of time training. We didn't have enough money to pay them what they should be getting. And we would have incredible turnover. A lot of the workers were like college students and they would just say they were going to stay and then they would leave and we'd have to retrain. You know, the training alone was like a three week training to be a respite worker. Um, there wasn't any funding from it. There's a there's a tiny little line in our funding from OMH for respite, which is like twelve thousand um, dollars. And it's just not enough to sustain any kind of a program. We so now we actually do some adult respite, which until Harmony came along, I didn't realize we could even do, <laughs> um, which is great, but that's just a little tiny amount. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Like we've tried everything. We've done events with food. We've done fun things. We used to have a program at the Y where we put it under family support services and we had um, the kids come and, but we said to parents, you have to stay and do a group in one of the rooms with us. Um, and they would just want to leave and drop the kid. And that happened for a long time until Office of Mental Health, Jean Sadawi told me, no, we can't do this. Um, and <laughs> it took us a long time to actually close down our respite program because it wasn't funded. That wasn't the funding. The funding is to work with parents, skill building, um, helping with school stuff, helping with um, uh, just what felt like, I think, to the parents is telling them how to be better parents. And that's not what parents wanted. Parents wanted us to like fix their kid, help my kid, fix my kid, take my kid. And by the way, I'm a person who thinks respite is so important. I think there should be so much money because we're talking about people with three children, all with mental health issues that just want to go to the freaking grocery store, you know, without it being a huge ordeal. Like that, don't tell me that doesn't help a family <laughs> functioning if we take their kids so they can go to the grocery store so they can, you know, take care of an appointment. Um, but we don't have funding for that. Mm -hmm. So it's just been a challenge. You know, it's been really hard to not just say to Harmony and Frank to give somebody else the funding. I don't know if that's where we're headed this year because I don't really know what else to do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, it's definitely seems very challenging and I don't, yeah, I just appreciate all that, that information. I know you guys are doing a lot of, of really good hard work. So thank you. Thank you.
Other questions or just feedback for um, this presentation? <laughs> Love the new name. Yay. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Awesome. yeah. Yeah, it's great. And thank you for the update. Thank you. How is the outreach the out downtown outreach center? How is that going? Um, so that's uh I should have probably explained that a little bit more. So the outreach center is okay. It um I expected a little more. <laughs> than what it's been. Um, it houses our psychosocial program. It houses a lot of our groups. Um, we've had a lot of, uh, you know, collaborations in there, programs, presentations in there. So it's sort of a vessel that's holding these programs I talked about. Um, and I and I liked the idea of having this place on the commons that was easily accessible and very visible for our agency. I also was kind of hoping that there would be more collaborative stuff happening. And I've invited a lot of agencies in, but um, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's not being as used as I thought it was gonna be. So that's another thing that we're gonna look at this year. I mean, if it's worth it to have that space if we're doing the same thing we're doing upstairs, downstairs. I'm not sure if it's, I'm not sure if it's, if, if it's, yeah, a good use of money. Well, thanks for giving us that information. It's good to know what's going on with that and that it has some challenges. Yes, I actually haven't signed the contract for the outreach center money this year because I'm not sure that we should take it. In one of your slides, but I will keep you posted. <laughs> in one of your slides, I saw that you're decreasing staff, or was it you decreased? Yeah, well, staff? that's like so. Again, I've been here 24 years, and we used to have way more staff. I think we had like 15 staff when I started, and. Um, so I've noticed that because, so since I've started, salaries have increased, like, Jenny, do you know how much? I mean, our starting wage was like eight fifty, dollars and now it's nineteen fifty. dollars but our funding has barely gone up. So naturally, when people leave or, you know, um, get, or I let them go, <laughs> which has happened sometimes, um, we end up like increasing salaries and asking people to do more basically. And um, so we have less staff than I would like to have. Um, but, you know, I'm looking for opportunities. I've just filled out a huge grant with Park Foundation and we're always looking for opportunities. I'm also looking for some way to replace family support funding with just peer support funding and hoping that because it's uh, growing in popularity, there are going to be sources of funding for it. I like to just have money to do peer support. When someone walks in the door, we just provide them whatever we need. And sometimes it's like someone comes in with paperwork from DSS that they can't deal with because they just got out of the hospital or we're dealing with someone right now who's being evicted because uh, you know part of their symptoms are they can't take care of their place so there's a lot of that kind of work that's um you can't put it in a box you know we just kind of people walk in and we're like what do you need what do you need so you can take care of your mental health um and that's a lot of it so I, I just wanted to add one thing, if that was okay. I mean, I know the outreach center, I want to say, um, we are struggling to collaborate in the greater community, but the services that we provide as far as support group activities and the one-on-one -on -one and all of that, that's not, that's definitely not decreasing. We're seeing an absolute increased, increased need uh, to yeah. the point where we've had to consider wait lists. And that's where, as, as Josephine is talking about, family money and some of the streams of money, we've had to really think about what are the needs in the community and what's the money 
that we're getting and is there a mismatch because yes. um and so that's what we've had to really look at yeah we have a wait list now for one-on-one -on -one peer support which is hard because we're like the place where we tell people to come while they're waiting for clinical services because we don't have a limit to how many times you can come in and for the first time just the last two weeks we're sitting and having conversations about how are we going to manage a waiting list this has never happened before where we have to like take people who are coming in every week um, and maybe time limit them and put them at the bottom of the list and see new people. Like this is the first time that we're dealing with that. And it's kind of sad. Yeah. So are you seeing an increase because of, you know, we're post COVID or is it, is it because your staffing is, has decreased? So you have more, uh, uh, you know, people per, per peer. Um, I think it's post COVID. I think that there's been way more attention um, and urgency for mental health um, and our numbers have steadily increased for requests for services since COVID, definitely. Um, and our, I like our staff hasn't decreased that much in the last few years. It was, it's, it, it hasn't really decreased that much in the last few years. I should say that. <laughs> Yeah, and you said one of your slides, you're expanding or you hope to expand. Did I hear this correctly in the rural rural areas? Is that going to be possible given the, your financial and staffing challenges? Well, hopefully those counties will give me some money. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've actually talked, who did we talk to? Cayuga County? We've yeah, talked to a yeah. couple of people that want services. And yeah, I would have to say, you got to pay us. You got to yeah. find some money. Yeah. But um. Oh, and then Seneca County too. Yep, okay, you good. We, you know, we were talking about like just having a peer specialist with hours at a at like Ovid primary care, you right. know, um, that kind of a thing. But yeah, they would have to, the counties would have to pitch in some money. Cayuga, Seneca, and also Portland, they all do not have um, yeah. mental health associations and have sort of expressed interest. Um, well, Portland has an MAJ, but it's a mailbox and a phone in someone's yeah. house, so they might need some assistance. <laughs> yeah, you do incredibly great work. It's just kind of disheartening to hear about the financial challenges and the staffing yeah. challenges, given, yeah. you know, the tremendous work that you do. And obviously the need is there. So thank you. Really, yeah. Yeah, it's very important work. I can say, though, that um, what you're talking about with your funding not growing and people making more money, that's pretty common for mm -hmm. smaller agencies. It's hard to um, manage that kind of change. And people, Absolutely. just because they need money, want to work full time, mm -hmm. even if it's hard for them, is what I'm finding, too. And so it just all around is a tough time in yeah, that regard. I, honestly, I think we've had some part-time people that could have been full-time, um, but that is such a huge chunk for us to take on full-time with benefits and yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we've, I mean, most of our, our peer specialists actually want part-time. Some of them are supplementing, sub, can't talk. <laughs> their income they're on um social security disability and they can work a few hours um and that's been great but yeah we've had some people that i think we would have given full time to if we had more money any other questions for josephine Thank you so much, yeah. Josephine. This was a great um, refresher for all of us, yeah. maybe new for some. So appreciate your time. Thank you. Nice to see everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any other comments about that? presentation. Oh, okay. So should go back to the beginning. Um, do we have any additions or deletions to the um, agenda? No. Okay. 
Um, let's, can I have a motion to approve the minutes that were uh, sent out with the agenda? Thank you, Sheila uh, made the motion. Any, um, oh, well, in a second. And <laughs> Jessica, thanks. Um, so any discussion or edits that people have? Nope. Okay, do we wanna take a vote then? All in favor of passing these minutes? Great, thank you. Anybody abstain or? Guess not, you're quiet bunch. <laughs> Everybody wants to get outside, right? But now it's dark. <laughs> Okay, so privilege of the floor. Any questions or comments? Okay, then I have no board correspondence or announcements unless Frank or Ron has something or, or Harmony, anything? No? Okay. Then the next thing on the agenda is the deputy commissioner's report. So Harmony, you're on. Okay. Well, um, I didn't know exactly what Josephine was gonna say, but I think that it fits um, nicely with my first uh, update I wanted to give you. And this is really good news. We are going to have a children's act team. We're sharing it with Tavi County and it is starting in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, really, really good news. The other, uh, program that I'm hoping, keep your fingers crossed, is a home-based crisis intervention. It's uh, They have too many programs for children with a lot of letters in them, and oh, it's hard to keep them all straight. So HBCI, or home-based crisis intervention, the state has put out uh, under Office of Mental Health, uh, two different RFPs. So it's a little confusing. Both of the RFPs are under OMH, but one of them is home-based crisis intervention services for uh, children through mental health service that have mental health needs, and the other is through uh, kids who have OPWDD or developmental disability needs. So two separate RFPs, both for our region. Uh, they've cl they're closing fairly soon, so hopefully we'll get some good news that we have those teams. So how those teams look different is that an ACT program is for children uh, 10 years and above. And it typically, uh, uh, the team works with families who may have more intensive needs uh, than the home-based crisis intervention team. Uh, they're involved for eight months to a year. All of your services are uh, just within that team, just like in the adult model, where like your uh, medication management, your mental health treatment needs, everything's done by the ACT team itself. Home-based crisis intervention is um, a program that works for children five years of age and above. So that's a really good, good uh, need because we don't have respite services, which Josephine uh, talked a little bit about. Uh, so getting somebody intensive home-based intervention in the home that can work with a family. So the difference is it's shorter term. It starts at a younger age and you get to, to keep your entire system of services already, right? Because if you're only in there six to eight weeks, you don't want to get rid of the psychiatric support you might have in a family or the clinical um, pieces like the therapist they might see every week. But what it provides is really very intensive. And we're talking a person uh, full-time would have a caseload maybe of two or three children they work with. So it's very intensive in-home support to really help with the family systems work that um, the family needs. Harmony, could you give an example of what, you know, of a family that who might qualify for that? So, so I, I think it, it, you would see a child that's probably having a lot of crises. They might be going to the emergency department. They're not getting hospitalized. The family's really distraught. So if a child is having a lot of mental health needs or there are other members of the family are having mental health needs and, and they're not getting adequately met, then the family system really gets a little bit more distorted over time because everybody's under a lot of stress. So you have this person who can come in and really help like, okay, here's the behaviors you're seeing. Let's put a behavioral plan in place. How can I support you with that plan? 
Um, and so oftentimes families need additional support. There may be other issues with other children in the home, that sort of thing. So it really takes that broader perspective, not just looking at the child as an identified patient, but looking at the whole entire family system and providing maybe 10 hours a week in-home support for the family so they can model here's some ways that you might want to respond with your child when they do this kind of behavior and really give the family the tools to respond differently. So it's a big um, add on to the family, uh, but it doesn't replace the rest of the support systems. And it's very intensive. So it's only for like a, a couple of months. Will there be collaboration with the school? They collaborate with all the other, all the other systems where the child it services, yeah. Are there any programs for the really young child, five and below? There are not anything. There's nothing like that in the home right now that comes through mental health. There might be more services out of the public health side. Yeah, I mean, the yeah. early intervention for development of disabilities um, and the pre k programs um, provide therapeutic services for uh, developmental disabilities and delays, um, not necessarily mental health or substance abuse. So we we can treat children in our clinic three years and older, yeah. but it's not that intensive home-based yeah. kind of model. Yeah, it's a very good question. It's definitely something we need. When we look at our continuum care for children, um, some of the more prevention oriented programs that also have a lot of letters, CFTSS, don't ask me now what that stands for, <laughs> and um, home-based community services. Those programs have really struggled. They're regional models. Um, one of them has an office space in our building, Elm Crest, and there's Pathways, uh, Racker, um, their, their Hillside, and, and you know I'm missing one. There's one other program that provides those prevention oriented services in the home. Um, they have struggled with getting staff and that continues. We're seeing like, I think staffing improve in many other places. So hopefully that one will follow because uh, the goal is to build out that whole continuum. So you have these prevention oriented programs that can do in-home supports and services for people. And then you have um, your more intensive programs. And by having that whole gamut of array of supports for people, the goal will be we're not going to see so many children end up in residential treatment facilities or in hospitals. And when they do, they could potentially discharge. So you can look at the ACT program as maybe a good potent discharge mm -hmm. service for some families that might have more significant and serious mental illness with children. And then the other program is more like a preventive, like, well, this is a child we're seeing going through our emergency department a lot, like that child could benefit from the HBCI program. If we get it, fingers crossed, mm -hmm. I think we have applicants. So hopefully okay. we'll have some more good news. And then when we look at our system of care for children, the one piece and that Josephine was talking about, and, and Josephine and I have had lots of conversations about that stuff she's telling you about, um, the code, the program codes that the dollars that uh, they get through um, all maids that are passed mm -hmm. through our us, right, um, are very limited to what you can do. And what we hear over and over again is people really like the respite program. Personally, I think a respite for two or three hours probably would prevent some child abuse cases, right? Mm -hmm. People are super stressed out. If you have a child with high needs, mm -hmm. you really need a couple of hours a week. And then um, when you think about respite outside, um, like if you need longer term respite, mm -hmm. you have to go outside of our county. Uh, either to Binghamton or to Elmira. And I mean, that's just like the transportation challenges that creates for families is very, very difficult. Especially They're, because it's voluntary. So it's voluntary. It's to say if a child says, I'm, you know, a 14 year old says, I'm leaving now, and they start walking down a street in the middle of Elmira in the middle of the night, you know, you're, you have trying to figure out how you're going to get there. That can be a really hard, hard thing. So it's trying to find a solution to respite. Sally, uh, our ch children's spoke coordinator, um, and I have been talking about like, is it, what can we come up with that might be a more local solution to that? We've looked at other county models. That one still seems to be the toughest one for us to figure out uh, because we know it's a big need for people. Yeah. Um, once if 
once we can get these um, prevention programs better staffed, we do have five agencies that provide them and hopefully we'll see the tide turn and they're able to do that more. They've increased the rate of reimbursement for those programs. I don't know if it's enough, but the state has put a lot more into trying to reimburse those programs better so they can pay more for their staff. And then if we get these high end, um, you know, act, Children's Act is a huge step forward and hopefully we'll get these other programs. We'd have the whole array once we have respite. That's the Good. one piece that's really standing out for us. Um, but it's so much better than where we were a year ago, right? Um, and Dr. Duquan, maybe after this, if you can give me a contact person, we want to link our the Children's Act team with somebody in the emergency department uh, with children that I'm not sure exactly who to who to connect, okay? Um, I did uh, get some news today that the OWDD commissioner, that's the Office Pe of People with Developmental Disabilities, the commissioner for the state, Newfield, or yeah, I don't know if it's Newfield, Neffield maybe is better pronunciation. She announced her resignation today. Um, she's been in that position for about two years. Um, she needs to spend more time with her family. She's going to be in that role until June. So they haven't announced anybody uh, new yet. And um, Jan, I, you didn't mention, I don't think I missed it. Um, the subcommittee chairs and Jan uh, and unfortunately Larry was able to be with us. So I do owe you the recording, Larry. Met with Samantha Fletcher from the Office of Mental Health. Uh, she has a new position. It's in workforce development. Uh, and both on recruitment and retention. And we're the first county that's reached out to her to ask about gathering data, because um, that's in our local services plan, um, to ask agencies to provide us some information about like um, what uh, their challenges are in terms of workforce, um, both in recruitment and, re and retention, and then uh, what's its impact. And she's a, a data analyst expert. <laughs> so she was very excited to talk to us and gave our subcommittee chair some good ideas. So the goal is they'll create this form and then all the organizations that get funding through uh, the LGU will be asked, all their contracts say that they're gonna be asked to complete a form at least annually this year, because it's the first year and then it will be quarterly every year after. We'll ask them to, to give us the data quarterly once we get the form hopefully created um, starting next quarter. But we also know it's an, a new ask, so we want to give them time to break into it and ask other agencies, agencies to voluntarily give us that information. Uh, so I think they're hopefully in the final stages of trying to figure out that form. And I think we can do some data, some of that data collection here um, with Ross. You met Ross when he did the presentation on the housing. He, I talked to him a little bit about what she said that she needed. He goes, yeah, I know how to do that. So... <laughs> I think we might be able to use this ones to help us uh, really collect the information and have it fill on a spreadsheet and automatically fill so we don't have to time and give us some ideas to start and then, you know, get it better. So we'll look at more like what kinds of positions are we struggling with in our counties? It, because you have that vacancy, how many people don't get served? So we can really show that impact to the um, as, and be good advocates. Um, is she, she doing the, the thing I was unclear on because we were just talking about analyzing data? Is is she doing anything else for workforce recruitment? Oh, that's her whole and job. So she, she was just she didn't. When she wants to come and meet with our board. She would do, like virtually and ask you questions. I think she could talk a lot about what she's doing in her job. She's only been in it for a few months. Uh, so, but she's looking at trends and patterns around the state, around workforce, and her job is to, I think, make some recommendations and um, come up with some other solutions at the state level to help support. Because they see in everybody's local service plan, I don't think there was probably a county that didn't say we're having a workforce crisis. So um, I think they really wanted to dedicate her and a few other staff to trying to come up with some other ways to improve that for us. So we'll, we'll see. I mean, they've done a lot around um, offering uh, people scholarships to get into the field. Now they're doing more of that kind of work. OMH and OPW, I think OPWDD was actually a leader in a lot of that. 
uh, some of the ideas they're doing, but they're trying like, how do we build? We know we're not going to fix this crisis and workforce in a year. How do we look at like the next five to 10 years? How to get more people interested in it? Um, so I think she probably could share some of those ideas with us too. So it's a big, big problem. Uh, the innovative housing intensive supports for Tompkins County, the RFP has closed and Howard is a member of the committee that's helping us uh, select an RFP from that. Uh, so we're hoping to move that work uh, forward in the next few weeks. The mobile supportive services RFP, that's the fancy name for what used to be um, the uh, family and children's outreach worker program. Because there's so many outreach worker programs, they all do different things. It felt like it needed a name that sort of distinguished what it is. Um, that RFP will be closing, I think, in late March and in uh, April, early April. I think April 1st is when the group that's going to review RFPs will be getting together. So that will be coming out hopefully soon. Um, and then ISCA Housing Authority, I don't know if all of you got in, any information about that or if it matters to you in your, in your work, but um, they are offering affordable housing lottery for three different sites. And the applications are due April 1st and they will be hosting their lottery on April 16th. So if anyone needs more information about that, we send it out to um, all of our clinicians and identified a, um, somebody who has a, some housing experience here as a person that would support any of our clients who might want to put in an application for that. So good news uh, on that front as well. That's all I have. Are there any questions? Thanks, Harmony. Yeah. I think it's Frank's turn now. It's completely unfair. I'm sorry. I all the good stuff. It's it's the good stuff. Good stuff. You've had all the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so where to start? A um, couple of things. Uh, First off, probably let's talk about the department. Uh, everyone probably by now has seen the Ethical Voice article that came out a few weeks ago um, that was uh, driven by a former employee uh, that made uh, has made claims against the department. Um, the uh, the employee, I can say this because they said it in uh, into the the media, uh, was with us for about two months, um, and I ultimately made the decision that um, that uh, employee uh, was not a fit for the organization, um, and we separated them from employment with us. Um, subsequent to that, a complaint was filed with the county's human resources department, um, and that is currently still under investigation. So uh, there, uh, in any HR matter, we're not going to speak about the particulars of that publicly. We're we're not able to, um, as is often in these cases, the employee can say whatever they want. That's their 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 choice, and and they're they're welcome to it. Um, but we we're not going to respond publicly uh, to HR issues. Um, I am not in charge of the investigation. Um, I know that several employees, including Harmony, have been interviewed as part of that investigation. Um, I don't know its status. I don't know when it will be complete. Um, and I, of course, don't know what the result of it is. So um, don't have a lot that I can really share or talk about. Um, I think what I would about the specifics of that instance, what I would point to um, is that we've made a lot of effort over the last few years to uh, make health equity a focus of our work here as a department. Um, we've done a lot of work to try to diversify our workforce um, in many ways, um, not, uh, not just people of color, but making sure that our workforce is as reflective of our community as a whole as much as we could. Um, we have made efforts to um, try to make our programming more inclusive here at the department. Staff um, know that it's a priority for us uh, as an organization. And um, we also know that we're not going to be perfect as we go along that journey. Uh, and there will be times where um, we'll learn and we'll do better. Uh, and we're committed to that. Uh, so uh, I just, from a board perspective, I just want you all to hear directly from me that we continue to be committed to those efforts. Um, and we're also committed to being called out if we're wrong. 
uh, and making sure that we uh, we learn from that and do things the right way. Um, so uh, we're uh, we're going to continue that work as we move forward. Yeah, I'm happy to field any questions. I, I'm not sure there'll be much I'll be able to add to what I just said, but I'm happy to to take questions on that. Oh, Larry, yeah, you're muted, Larry. Larry. Will we get at least a synopsis of the report or any recommendations that are appropriate to the board? Uh, assuming the county administration says that I can do that, absolutely. Okay. Uh, it's not my investigation, nor will it be my report, so I can't promise you anything. Uh, but uh, certainly we're committed to transparency wherever it's appropriate. And if authorized, we'll definitely share with you. Great. Thanks for your update on that, Frank. Right. Um, so moving right along. <laughs> You've probably also seen in the newspaper that uh, the Alcohol and Drug Council uh, is has suspended operations. Um, they are an independent, uh, nonprofit organization. Um, we know that over the last several years, they have uh, at the community's behest, really taken on trying to expand the services their organization uh, would provide, uh, as well as expand the scope of uh, services available in the community, namely through the detox stabilization facility. Um, I think we all also know that they've struggled um, with uh, staffing related to that. Um, Oasis has provided them money uh, for uh, additional monies to try to address that for ramping up. The county has provided them additional funding over the last three years uh, to fill in some gaps while things ramped up. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, things finally got to a place where uh, they were no longer able to continue to operate financially. Um, there obviously was a changeover in leadership with the retirement of their longtime executive director, Angela Sullivan, in the summertime. Um, and so uh, it was a difficult place, right? It was a difficult place for the folks that uh, Stacey Cangelosi, I think many folks might know, was filling in as the interim executive director. Um, and uh, it, it was a big ask. It was a big ask to kind of move that ship along. Um, so the unfortunate uh, kind of ending of it is that um, through this week, staff from ADC with emergency funding uh, from Oasis are uh, making sure that there's a safe transition of care for uh, all of the current clients. I can tell you as of today, there are no longer any clients in the stabilization program. Um, they have all been transitioned to other, uh, to wherever they chose. Um, and the same thing is occurring with the outpatient clients as well. Um, the important thing to know is that the client has choice, right? And so um, CARS uh, under the CHS umbrella has been willing and able to take on as many clients as choose them um, through this. They, they were ready and willing to take everyone, um, but it is really up to the client to choose if, if that's where they want to go. So um, as ADC has been contacting those clients, um, they're of course notifying them of the closure and uh, trying to work on trans transition plans and they provide them with a list of providers in the region, uh, everywhere from Syracuse to Elmira to Binghamton and locally uh, for the, the clients to choose where they, uh, where they want to, to continue their care. Uh, and then they facilitate the transition of that care. Um, I'm not gonna say that uh, they haven't or won't lose clients to care, right? Because some of them will just say, I don't wanna go anywhere else and I'm, you know, it, it is the unfortunate nature of, of something like this happen, happening. Uh, it's not going to be because of lack of effort, right? They are working their their tails off to try to make all of those phone calls to be available um, and uh, make sure those transitions happen as safely as possible. Um, so we're expecting that will 
um, kind of be wrapped up by the end of this week is the expectation. Um, and then at that point, uh, the conversations about the future will start. Um, Oasis, uh, the county, uh, and ADC in whatever form it may be, as well as Cayuga Health Systems uh, as a community partner that is interested in the future, um, are all ready to come to the table and figure out how we get the detox stabilization facility open. Um, so I don't know what the future is. I don't know what the name on the building will be, um, but I do know everyone that I've talked to is 100% committed to trying to get that facility operational as soon as it can be. Um, the need in our community hasn't changed. Um, a lot of money has been invested already into the facility, um, and now we need to figure out a plan on how we get it to operational. Um, so that's kind of where things are. Um, I, as soon as I, I can't promise that we're going to have answers in a week, two weeks, even two months, right? There's when you have one agency that's in, you know, the fiscal situation that ADC is, there's a lot of legal things that have to occur that I are way over my head. So um, there will be obviously leadership from Oasis and the lawyers all over the place will come together and figure out what needs to be done. Um, I think the, the biggest challenge is we'd like to launch the detox stabilization in a debt-free environment, right? And so that's the path that we have to kind of travel um, here over the next few months to figure out. So I think that's kind of where ABC is. Yeah. Um, I just wondered, I can't remember, did they serve more than Tompkins County at the detox center that they, was it more than one county? Yeah, it was the regional, but uh, just so you know, I think there were eight clients at the stabilization facility when the decision was made. Um, so it was a matter of uh, relocating eight folks, uh, some of which I believe went to CARS Residential, others went to some other inpatient uh, facilities in the region. Um, and unfortunately, I know at least one of them was was discharged, um, was discharged. Yeah, I was asking more from the standpoint of, um, is that, a, is collaboration with other counties a uh, possible avenue for additional funding. I mean, not that that would save them completely, but. Yeah, so it's, it's funny you say that and you heard Josephine talking about other counties giving money. Um, we're unique here in counties giving money uh, to these types of things. So it's, it's not as simple as, <laughs> as it may sound or as we make it look here um, when there's requests. I think what needs to happen, and the facility is a regional facility. It was designed that way. Oasis sponsored it that way. Um, it is intended to be sustainable when operational, meaning that the billing is actually pretty good for those types of services. So the challenge is getting it operational so that way you can generate the revenue to sustain the organization. There is still a sustainable business plan that exists. It's just getting to that point where you're able to be operational enough to have the sustainable resources coming in the door. Um, I don't think the answer to this is more uh, one-time money from places. It really is trying to get a business plan in place with a partner that is large enough and um, has the capacity to bring staffing on, get them trained quickly and effectively, and then begin seeing clients, um, because that's really what's going to drive success. Looks like Larry has a question. Hey, Larry. So I, I, so I have a couple of things. One is that the explanation for why they um, found themselves unable to be sustained was somehow they just weren't bringing in the money from client services. So I don't understand how that happened. Um, I wonder if CARS and its outpatient treatment um, programming was, is having a, a similar um, problem. And I'm also wondering um, when this problem became apparent outside of the agency. Sure. Um, so I don't want to speak for cars, but I'm sure that they would tell you that uh, the financial models with billing are less than excellent. 
Um, uh, I think there, with any of these services, particularly ones that are being run by small to medium nonprofits, um, sustainability is always an issue because re if reimbursement was good, a lot of people would be doing it. And we wouldn't be in this boat where we don't have enough services available. So I, I think they, they would tell you that it's it's not great. Um, I, 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 I do know that they are in a much better fiscal situation since they've affiliated with Kega Health Systems. Um, so uh, there were times prior to that affiliation where we were getting the panicked calls from cars about not having enough money um, and needing advancements and those types of things. That has all stopped. Um, I, I was joking with Jessica when I talked with her a few weeks ago that I hadn't talked to her in a while. Right, because it had been where she was calling regularly about the financial stressors, but because the hospital is able to bring the expertise that they have, um, that not necessarily bringing money to the situation, but they have a fiscal, and right. you know they have a whole system there that knows how to run medical systems uh, and can help. Um, they can also help with recruitment because they have a whole recruitment team, and so that that's. Um, uh, scoping and scaling up uh, with that, that larger organization really has provided a lot of support. So I think CARS is in a much different, better place uh, than they were uh, prior to that affiliation. Um, and uh, yeah, so to ask your question about when uh, when it became when more of us became available, became aware of the situation with the Drug Council. Um, the uh, we were all aware that they were uh, uh, they were struggling to staff and they were struggling to pay for the staff that they were able to bring on because they didn't have enough to bring clients in yet. Um, as far as knowing that they were in a place where they were going to have to suspend operations, um, uh, I became aware uh, <laughs> two weeks before the announcement was made. Um, and I alerted Oasis to that immediately. And we began conversations about what was possible. Um, and ultimately the organization and their board made the decision that um, suspending operations was the most prudent thing for them uh, as an organization. And so I have a couple, I have a follow up question, which is, we obviously need the services that the Alcohol and Drug Council provided, even even to the you know thinking about it as numbers of slots of numbers of treatment professionals who could see numbers of clients. It's a huge loss. So, in addition to thinking about how can the um, how can the uh, the detox center get up and running. I hope somebody is thinking about how do we preserve the service. How do we preserve the resource that the that the alcohol and drug council was? Because it's not like suddenly there weren't enough clients, you know, and there or there wasn't a, there wasn't the need for. The services the drug council provided. Yeah, that's a really good point, Larry. And there's kind of three main areas that we have to pay attention to with this um, that the Alcohol and Drug Council was doing. Um, one, the detox stabilization, trying to get that operational, the outpatient component of their services, and then their prevention work. Right. right. So those are the three areas that they receive funding uh, to do, all three of which are. Uh, important and we need to figure out moving forward. Um, so um, how do I say this? Uh, there's there's a lot of conversation going on about how to address this situation. Um, it includes multiple independent entities from the county and from us uh, and OASIS. And those conversations aren't public. Um, nor can they be public uh, because of the nature of private organizations having independent but, boards. And so you, being, could, you could, I mean, you don't have to name them, but what kinds of organizations are having conversations with the powers that be? Uh, licensed, Oasis, 
OMH and DOH organizations. Okay. Um, two questions. One, um, I know right now they're in the stage of getting patients situated. Is there a plan for the workforce um, in terms of retaining as many of them in this field? And then also any thoughts you have about like ways that we as a board or we as a county could differently engage with our community nonprofits to foster a greater level of transparency around these types of, I mean, I think the, you know, the workforce survey is, is a really good step um, in that, in that avenue. But yeah, I mean, like I would just, I wish that we could have been a place that they could have come to us earlier. And I, knowing that there's lots of financial difficulties in the overall sector, I would want, to be a space where other organizations could come to us to see if we can be of help. Yeah, uh, so on the workforce situation, um, CARS through under the umbrella of Cuyahoga Health Systems has uh, initiated a rapid review process for anyone that uh, is interested. Um, there's no guarantee of job necessarily, but we to Larry's point, there are patients that need care. And so, um, with, uh, there are places that are providing that care in the community and need more help. So um, that, that that's one opportunity. Um, I know there are others. There are other agencies hiring. I believe Guthrie is looking for folks to, um, they've reached out to us. We don't provide those. A couple of people have reached out to us. We don't, we don't provide Oasis services, so it's not really a natural fit for us. But um, I, I think I think they will land yeah. someplace, and 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 I know that the CHS and and cars are trying to make it as easy as possible if it's appropriate to land with them uh, for that. Um, as far as um, you know, people coming to us and transparency, that's it, a really good point, uh, and I can tell you that both. Uh, the county slash me as the county's rep finding out about this um, and Oasis. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we were caught unawares um, of truly the depth of, of the problem. And there's a lot of, a lot of reasons for that, but it's not my story to tell. Um, certainly not in a public, a public setting. Uh, I imagine maybe at some point leadership at cars um, might be interested or willing to tell that story, but um, there's, we do get in a situation where, um, they are a separate entity, right? right. Larry, Larry, you love to, to say, Frank, go find out what's going on with that thing over there. And, uh, and I do my best to try to, to get those answers, but they don't report to us, right? They, they are their own entity and they have to make their own strategic decisions. And for some organizations, you know, making others aware is not part of what there is in their culture. You know, I'm not saying that's what happened here, but I'm just, I'm just sharing that, that, you know, these are private nonprofit organizations that have boards and executive directors and such that, um, you know, they have fiduciary responsibilities to their organizations as well. And, you know, they make the decisions they think, think are necessary. Um, I, I, I will say that, um, I don't think this was any one person's fault. Uh, I think it it, it was a, a a big a big ask for the Alcohol and Drug Council to uh, to take on the detox uh, and stabilization idea, and they had a really good plan. They worked really hard at it, and then they got smacked in the face with the reality of post COVID trying to address staffing and and those types of resources and. Um, it just the it was more than their organization could withstand. Um, so you know it's uh, I, and oftentimes we want to know who to blame or who's responsible for this. And you know, of course, you could always point fingers, but I, I really I think it was a confluence of circumstances that um, even the best of us in that situation would have struggled to navigate to a different finish line. Yeah. Any more good news? I'm done with the bad news. Yeah. I'm not here, you know? Yeah, I should have got first, right? So.
there is lots of great stuff going on. No, it really is. And, you know, even with, with all of it, I, you know, I, I, I think I mentioned it, Travis on the way in, you know, bad stuff happens, but it's also an opportunity, right? You know, that's, that's the way that we have to look at it, right? I think, you know, I sent an email to all staff after the Ithaca Voice article, you know, kind of just setting the tone, right? I make the decision, buck stops with me. If there's a problem, it's my problem. You guys are doing the good work of trying to achieve health equity in our community and we need to keep doing that, right? You know, same thing with the Alcohol and Drug Council. It, it's not what any of us would have wanted to see happen, certainly not in this way, um, but it, it's, it's redoubled my commitment to trying to figure out how do we get to this solution. And I think it's gonna, it's gonna make us all, some of us hyper focused on making sure we don't, you know, we don't run into that challenge again. So we'll get there. Um, it was going to take a little time to get it open anyway, right? It's taken a little time already. This is, you know, kind of a speed bump that might actually, you know, put us in a position where um, an organization with the resources to be able to support something this significant um, can come along and and help uh, help us achieve our goal of getting it operational. So. We're gonna we're gonna come out of it better when it's done. We just have to get over the speed bumps along the way. Frank, could you answer Jessica's question about the staff? I mean, is uh, retain the staff? I'm from the staff. Yeah, Cayuga okay. Health Systems and Cars has um, put in a rapid review process. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep, to try to bring anyone that's interested in working for them on, um, and I think they'll. I don't think they'll have a problem finding finding landing place. There's definitely demand. Any other questions for Frank about the situation? Uh, just one brief. Um, so I know that some of the OMH RFPs, um, and it seems like how Office of Mental Health want encourages um, places to move in the direction of these um, dual, um, duly OMH Oasis facilities, and I'm forgetting the abbreviations for them. I know that we've talked about, yes, okay. Um, is there any possibility with the restructuring and how we think about all these things that we could navigate our way into being a county that would qualify for the, those types of larger funding? I think one of the positives of this is it's Swipe the table clean, right? Right, and now we'll likely have additional partners at the table with different perspectives, um, trying to get us to the to the end game. There's a lot of things that we're still trying to build a 25 bed women's facility for cars up on the hill that's taken a decade plus. Um, we're still talking about intensive stabilization, you know, for OMH and OASIS things. Is there a potential match in that facility to do something like that there? Um, you know, I, I think there's, I think all of the options are on the table now to present, um, present, to present to OASIS and others to see what could work. Um, if you're talking specifically about our clinic, as I get asked this quite frequently, um, I don't think the county's in a position to expand the scope of service that we provide, right? We're, we are spending a large amount of money subsidizing the services that we're currently doing. I think, you know, our community vision is community partners that are willing to and interested in taking on these endeavors and trying to make them successful. Um, we're the safety net, so we're filling in the gap at the bottom, uh, but we, um, we really think that there's opportunity in you know, our, our Guthrie friends and our CHS friends are building, building buildings left and right, opening them up. Hopefully one of them someday will have some mental health and substance use. <laughs> and then so, yeah. Yeah. So, so we're just so excited to have you be here. And uh, Guthrie, to their credit, um, is trying to have a better um, community uh, involvement. Yeah, right. we, we've heard a lot more from them in the last couple of years. Um, than we did, you know, pre-COVID. So, um, you know, that's exciting, right? We, I, I'm partial to Cuyahoga Health Systems. I'll admit my bias, but um, they're a partner in our community that's providing a huge amount of service. So, um, there are there are folks out there that are looking at this. And as this idea of the hospital systems being responsible with the 1115 waivers and how all of that is going to shake itself out more and more of that is coming under the umbrellas of these large health systems. And so in order to control that, 
you got to provide those services to have the biggest impact. So that's why we're seeing these, you know, growth, rapid growth of the different hospital systems to, to get to a sustainable place because the time of small nonprofits is it's it's coming to an end, right? I mean, what happened with ADC, unfortunately, was inevitable. We were talking about it eight, 10 years ago, trying to find solutions and encourage them to be thinking differently um, because this was the inevitable end without coming under something, something bigger that could support the efforts because the system is just designed that way now. Everybody done with questions or comments? Great. Do I have a motion to adjourn right at seven or a little after? Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Stu.